Good evening. My name is Mary Watson. I'm Executive Dean of the School for Public Engagement at the New School. And on behalf of the New School, I want to welcome you all to this anniversary event for The Nation magazine. Um, nearly 100 years ago, well, which we typically talk about as the New School as a long time, but tonight we're going to talk about a history of 150 years of the nation. But nearly 100 years ago, the New School was founded on the principles of creating access to open education, integration across the liberal arts, humanities, and social sciences, and perhaps most importantly, scholarship focused on activist agendas. Uh, the founders of the New School, who included experiential educator John Dewey, literary scholar Alvin Johnson, economist Thorsten Veblen, and historian Charles Beard, came to the New School to found it as what they saw as an active statement against the rigidity and timidity of conventional universities. They left what they called the old school in an act of protest against the university's requirement that they sign a loyalty oath during the rise of World War I. In the 1930s, the university in exile was established at the New School. Under President Alvin Johnson's leadership, the New School sponsored more than 180 persecuted scholars and their families, establishing a place of refuge from rising fascism in Europe. Among those rescued were psychologists Eric Fromm, political philosophers Hannah Arendt and Leo Strauss, and philosopher Hans Jonas. So we've hosted many luminary faculty and students at the New School in the years that have happened since then, including luminaries, luminaries like Frank Lloyd Wright, Robert Frost, Martin Luther King, W.E. Du Bois, and Marlon Brando. Today, the New School has about 12,000 students, but we're still committed to the interplay between theory and practice, but most importantly, in focusing on learning with a purpose, and that purpose is to make a difference with the pressing social problems of the day. The Nation magazine was created by anti-slavery abolitionists four months after the assassination of Abraham Lincoln in 1865. As the oldest continually published weekly news magazine in the U.S., it has been a home for provocative and thoughtful writers reporting on struggles of social and economic justice. In the words of President Barack Obama, the nation exhibits that great American tradition of expanding our moral imagination, stoking vigorous dissent, and simply taking the time to think through our country's challenges anew. This year, the nation is putting on 150th anniversary celebrations in a dozen cities. And we at the New School, in our ongoing partnership with the nation for over 10 years now, are very pleased to sponsor this event tonight as the nation looks at its 150th anniversary and we grow close to our 100th anniversary. So now I'd like to turn the mic over to Laura Flanders, author and journalist from Grit TV, who will moderate tonight's discussion. Thank you for coming. I'll start here and then I'll move over here. Welcome everybody, thanks for coming out. I'm Laura Flanders. Let's bring on our panelists and I will introduce them as they sit. Don Gutenplan, come on in. The author of the great new biography, The Nation. Next up, let's see, Khalil Mohammed. Let's come on out. We are very glad to have you. Followed by Bob Herbert, who's coming out here. Once they're all settled. Katrina Vanden Heuvel. So we have an extraordinary evening in front of us tonight. Um, Katrina Vandel Vanden Heuvel, as you know, is the editor and publisher of The Nation magazine. If you don't know that, you are not paying attention. <laughs> Don Gutenplan at this end is, um, well, he's one of the writers for The Nation out of the London Bureau, but he seems to spend a good amount of time in Vermont as well. He's the author of American Radical, The Life and Times of I.F. Stone, and most recently, this new handy pocket edition, The Nation, a biography, which is also available in an e-book, a searchable e-book I was excited to see. Next to Don is Khalil Gibran Mohammed, who's the author of The Condemnation of Blackness, Race, Crime, and the Making of Urban America. He's also the director of the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture at the New York Public Library. <laughs> Bob Herbert, how we miss him from the New York Times op-ed page where he wrote for 20 years. <laughs> He's now a senior fellow at Demos and the author most recently of uh, lo oh, Losing Our Way. He's also working on a play that I'm excited to hear about, hear more about. Losing Our Way. Have we lost our way over these 150 years? Well, that's 
a little bit of what we're here to talk about. Um, we're here specifically to talk about activism, the coverage of resistance, the role of the nation in covering resistance. And I want to um, let the cat out of the bag right now that we're gonna be joined by in the second half of the program by some of the journalists who are for the nation right now covering resistance, those that we could gather uh, to New York. Sarah Leonard is here, Michelle Chen is here, and Michael, Michael Denzel Smith is here. So we've got a great conversation coming up. I do, I, I'm, I'm afraid I need I feel the need to start by talking about the people who are, we're missing today, the people that we might ha be holding in our hearts today as we think about resistance. Um, Michael Denzel Smith actually wrote not long ago about, he asked the question, what tactics are appropriate for movements in an era when America seems to have lost its ability to be shamed? And I think I feel a little as if we're in one of those moments that is a tipping point moment. Are we capable any longer of being shamed? Particularly, are we capable of being shamed and grief struck enough to take action? I'd like to read the names of those who died, who were killed, who were shot in Charleston, South Carolina last week. It, it, it just, forgive me if it's a dour way to begin, but I think the nation is about the hidden history of resistance. It's also about a hidden history of insistence that we can make change for the better and that in fact there are people out there today working to make that change. For 150 years, from opposing the Spanish-American War to filling Madison Square Garden with people calling for a break in diplomatic relations with fascist Spain, to covering Podemos and the extraordinary optimism of the election results in Madrid and Barcelona in Spain this, this last month. The nation has been there. There have been other moments too. We'll talk about some of those. Uh, but it has been, I think, for me, a place where I could reliably go in search of the whispering breath of protest movements, the insistent voice of possibility, and I think some of that sense of outrage and shame, whether expressed in the poetry of Claude McKay or um, the, a long list of poets, Langston Hughes, Alice Walker, the list goes on, cultural movers who have touched us in our hearts as well as in our heads, um, they reminded us that there is no possibility outside of the realm of human imagination. And I think at this moment, I want us to just imagine in our hearts the following people. Clementa Pinckney, Cynthia Hurd, Sharonda Coleman Singleton, Taiwanza Sanders, Ethel Lance, Susie Jackson, DePayne Middleton Doctor, Myra Thompson, Daniel Simmons Sr. Are we capable? of not just being in resistance, but insisting on real change, more than just grieving, actually acting. It'll take a lot of nation reporting, I think, uh, and others too. But this is what this evening's about. 150 years for any publication is no mean feat. And I wanna take a moment to thank everybody who has played a role in this evening's celebration because we need to celebrate as much as we embrace how much there is left to be done. So Peter Rothberg, thank you so much. Our, uh, Peter Rothberg, come on now. Pam Tillis here at the New School. Thank you so much for making this happen. And of course, uh, our Executive Dean, Mary Watson, thank you so much for, for having us here tonight. Let me ask you, Don, now that I've sunk the mood deep into the floor, um, <laughs> let me ask you to take us back a little bit to 1865. Uh, is it really true that the nation was brought together by what, a landscape architect and the man who was to become the first art history professor at Harvard, and what did they have to do with the magazine of covering the hidden history of resistance? Yes, it's true. Oh good, this works. Um, the Nation was an idea before it was a magazine. It was the idea of Frederick Law Olmsted, better known in New York for Prospect Park and Central Park. 
And then um, Frederick Law Olmsted, though, was an impulsive man, and he ran off to California to run a gold mine in 1863. <laughs> but he gave his friend E.L. Godkin a letter of introduction to Charles Eliot Norton, who was the first professor of art history at Harvard. And he went to, and was at that time also the editor of a magazine called the North American Review, which was a quarterly. Um, Godkin went up to Cambridge to see Norton, and Norton thought it was a great idea, but offered him no money. And at that point, the nation died. And it revived again in 1865 um, when a Philadelphia abolitionist called McKim, James McKim, whose son was the McKim of McKim, Mead, and White, the architect. So there's architecture and the nation are tied up with each other. Um, wanted to found a journal basically to bridge two sides of the blood feud that was dividing American abolitionists in half. On the one hand, there were those who thought that with the passage of the 13th Amendment and the end of slavery, abolitionism's work was done and they should go home and do something else. Among other things, they wanted to fight for votes for inequality for women, some of these people. Uh, and the other side said, no, our work is not done, our work is just beginning. There are freed slaves, but they do not have genuine equality. Well, we're still waiting for genuine equality, but um, in the meantime, both wings of the, that movement needed a place where they could argue with each other. And so McKim founded the nation uh, and appointed E.L. Godkin its presiding editor. Katrina. Um in addition to all the glorious moments of the history of the nation, there were also moments that caused H.L. Mencken to refer to it as perhaps the dullest publication of any sort ever printed in the world. <laughs> um, did you ever have any qualms taking over such a publication? Um, for, uh, your uncle, Alexander Coburn, your uncle, Alexander Coburn, ensured that the nation would never be dull, uh, <laughs> that it would be vibrant. Um, there's also a wonderful piece in the uh, special issue, which I hope all of you, if you haven't had a chance to look at it, by Hayward Broom, who thinks we don't, we, the nation in some of its moments has not fought hard enough, has not been insistent enough, has not resisted enough. Um, I will speak for those here, Victor Navasky, uh, the great former editor and uh, publisher of the nation, and I will speak in, for my tenure um, if resistance is life and force, I believe the nation is very spirited and rousing. And our journalism, I would submit, is about social change, is about social movements, because if you can change and organize the way people think in a peaceful, nonviolent way, change the narrative, I think that people will see a different America. And that is what the nation over 150 years has been, I would argue. We've lived through three reconstructions, we were there for the launch of the Telegraph, and we are here for the launch of Twitter. And we have been there through resistance. Uh, if there were two enduring, and I think Don would agree as the historian of the nation, two enduring areas and principles which we have stayed true to, despite the zigzags of the first 70 or so years, opposition and resistance to empire, from the Spanish-American War to Vietnam to Iraq to today's endless wars, and opposition and resistance to the abuse of civil liberties. Uh, Emma Goldman writing about the deportation of immigrants in the 20s. Victor Navasky writing about the ideas that have been marginalized and stigmatized due to the obsession in this country with anti-communism, McCarthyism, or as one might say, having learned more, Hooverism, um, and I think so we lift up ideas that should never be considered marginalized and that we are here to lift up and support dissident, rebellious voices. And the arc of history in the nation is one of challenging a downsized politics of excluded alternatives and resisting and insisting. I'll end by saying my, if I'm proud of it's being a steward of Alter understanding there are always alternatives in history, politics, life, love, culture, <laughs> and also that if there is a reason for the nation's longevity, because it is daunting, uh, it's, it's ferocious independence, but it is also a belief that it is not politic, parties or policies 
but what can happen when you tell people the truth that can lead to change? Bob, do you remember the first time you came across the nation? No. <laughs> because it was so it was so long ago. I mean, I, I feel like I've been reading the nation um, forever. But what I can't believe is that um, Katrina cited the Haywood Bruin piece because that's exactly the one that I was going to mm. cite. And that's a piece from 1929. So, but anyway, um, he did essentially say that he thought that the magazine was too timid, that it didn't, um, it, it wasn't rough and tumble uh, enough. And the reason I was struck by that. Um, article was not because of its reference to the nation, because I think that the, the nation is a pretty great magazine, frankly. Um, but I think that that's one of the big problems with our country. We have these, it, we were talking about it a little bit in the green room, we have these enormous challenges that we seem to think we can't do anything about. For example, um, you know, money in politics or gun controls or, you know, God forbid, race relations, which is, you know, seems like it's with us uh, forever. Um, uh, someone mentioned that we can't even seem to fix our roads and bridges. And I think that one of the reasons that there's sort of this barrier to making progress on these issues is that the folks that I consider to be on my side don't fight hard enough. And I came of age back in the 1960s when it seemed like everybody was fighting, uh, going crazy, whether it was over, you know, uh, against the war or whether it was for civil rights or whether it was the women's movement or uh, whether a little later it was the gay rights movement, you know, but it was a period when it just seemed like it was normal to fight to the max for the issues that you cared about. And I also believe, mistakenly it turned out, that progress was normal too, that progress would just continue. I, you know, I, I did not anticipate Ronald Reagan and everything that came afterwards. So uh, maybe we can talk, I can get a chance to talk about it a little later, but I just think that if we could get more people to become more active, not just to talk about things, not just to write about things, but to get out there and um, direct action and fight for some of these big issues, I think it would be a, a, a great deal easier to make progress on them. Do you agree with Bob on the mission of the magazine, Khalil, your sense of what you want the nation to be doing? Absolutely. I, I wanted to, to actually answer the question you posed to Bob, because I do remember okay. when I first encountered the <laughs> nation. He, that's because he's younger. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Um, <laughs> Thanks a lot, man. <laughs> If I look as good as you, Bob, when, yes. when that time comes, <laughs> we'll both be winners. Uh, so I, I, had, I was in graduate school, actually. And uh, I mean, I, probably for some of you in the audience, uh, all of a sudden you sort of wake up and your appetite for wrestling with, uh, with history, with contemporary issues, with um, smart analytical writing, uh, for me was both uh, a conversation with the books I was reading as a history student uh, in a PhD program and trying to keep up with the world. Uh, I was 22 years old and uh, it was the first magazine of its kind uh, to capture my attention uh, and, and definitely helped me to understand. So this was in 1995 when I started graduate school mm. in reading. <laughs> Reading, reading the nation. So I do not accept that. <laughs> so I, I think that it's hard for me to imagine who I am today, and it's hard for me to um, not think about even the research process mm -hmm. as a graduate student without thinking about what was the nation's position um, on the topics of interest to me as a historian studying the early 20th century uh, and encountering the voice of African-American resistors, Du Bois, uh, for me, most prominently uh, in the nation, um, knowing that that magazine, knowing the voice of the magazine in a contemporary moment shared something in the past mm. that I wanted to see uh, in real time. And, and just, just as a note, this is before ProQuest and JSTOR and digitization and OCR, so you really did have to go on a fact-finding mission uh, to find articles and keywords don't say the dread word microfilm. <laughs> <laughs> you disagreed. I heard you whisper that you disagreed, Katrina, around the mission of the magazine. No, I, 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 I venture to disagree with Bob because I do think we're at a tipping point moment, as Laura described, where I think there's more awareness 
that we're in the fight of our lives for citizen control of our country, our government, of corporate power, and that it's a movement moment. It's a movement moment that we haven't seen since the 60s, whether it's Black Lives Matter or 400,000 plus people in the streets around the climate march, um, whether it's the Dreamers, uh, whether it's what we've seen in these last weeks fight back against a corporate back trade agenda. Uh, in 1993, the nation did a special issue on NAFTA, cover story by Noam Chomsky, many writers. That passed. There's now, I think, historical, you know, accumulation of historical knowledge as to what that those have done. So I think that there is more mobilization, but I also agree that more, much more in this big country. And I think what we've seen in these last days, um, I say humbly, is um, how we have failed to reckon with um, our history, with the structural racism that uh, is so deep, and the nation was founded in that moment, and Reconstruction reminds us of what has failed to be done, and that there has not been truth or reconciliation or a true reckoning with our history. Don, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, I just want to say a couple of things. One is, um, the right have a lot of secret weapons, or not so secret weapons. One is that they have all the money, often they have much of the power. Um, we, on the other hand, like to think that we have justice on our side. But another secret weapon is the secret weapon of entitlement. And I think that's what being 150 years old gives the nation. It's something special because it, it lets us, it reminds us that this is our country, that we've been here a long time, we've been fighting a long time, and that we have done great things together. And I think the way that I just want to give a little example of the way that past and future can connect because for me, what the history of the nation is about is knowing that the, the arc of the universe is very long, but if you arm people with the truth, then they can bend it towards justice. So I, I just want to read you one paragraph from a very long book, <laughs> but it's about something that happened when the nation was founded. And it's about the Civil War. So the biggest economic consequence of the war was also the least digested. The federal government's expropriation and liquidation of the South's largest asset class, the slaves themselves. Americans might argue forever about whether Washington should take this or that step to intervene in the private sector. But given what Lincoln had done with the Emancipation Proclamation and what the whole con Congress accomplished in the 13th Amendment, there was no doubt about what the government could do. In 1860, the four million African American Americans in slavery were worth about $3 billion, between $65 billion and $11 trillion today to their owners, representing in many cases the bulk of their worth. Before the war, even most abolitionists balked at the cost of buying out slavery. When the English abolished slavery in the colonies in 1833, the British government paid slave owners 20 billion pounds in compensation, an enormous sum, accounting for fully 40% of the Treasury's annual budget, or the equivalent in today's money of at least $26 billion. Viewed in those terms, as Christopher Hayes recently observed in The Nation, the most radical demands of the climate justice movement are truly modest proposals. So I just think we should remind ourselves that we have done great things and that whether it's sequestering carbon or whether it's doing something sane about guns at last or whether it's about actually fulfilling the promises made in Reconstruction 150 years ago, these things are long processes, but we have a long history with them. That's all. But there is an interesting history there in terms of the nation's position vis-a-vis -vis movements. I mean, the nation at that time that, that you're quoting from was very much in favor of kind of abandoning the, the, the freed African Americans, was against the eight hour day, was against national intervention uh, in the railroad companies, and saw change on those fronts. It, it was against the Spanish-American War. But one of the things that I'd love to go back to is this sense of it was a place for dispute. And my curiosity, my question was, was it evident at the time that it was a place for dispute, or did it rather change from editor to editor, publisher to publisher? What would you see in the actual pages in any one moment? Well, it was a page for dispute about 
it was, for example, a, 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 a place for dispute about civil rights for the freed slaves from the beginning. And although, as I say in the book, um, the nation completely betrayed and sold out African Americans for basically at the end of the 19th century until about 1915, and I think partly what brought it back to sanity and justice was Oswald Garrison's Villard, Villard the editor's friendship with W.B. Du Bois. Um, but it's also true that it responded to movements. Now, the first movement it responded to was a movement that's incredibly successful today. It's called the Republican Party. And the nation was actually the house organ of the Republican Party at the end of the 19th century. So, uh, and it was, it was moved away from that. That was also the period when Mencken said it was the most boring magazine in the universe. <laughs> but it was moved away from that in part by its experience of World War I when it opposed America's entry and was criminalized, vilified, marginalized, and actually banned from the males. Uh, and that pushed it and pushed Villard to the left. I, I don't want to go on for too long, but the short answer is editors and their personalities make a huge difference. Well, I was going to add to that because I think uh, one of the things that is captured in, 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 in the book is this tension between civil liberties and an activist state. Uh, and so in the interest of race, there's a moment early in the context of the Civil War where it's clear this is a moral abomination and the abolitionists um, have a clear line of demarcation between slavery and freedom. But what happens when the state has to assert an activist agenda uh, that is contrary to individual liberty at the local level? Mm -hmm. And is that tension that uh, essentially resolves with a kind of liberalism without any teeth? Uh, that essentially African Americans are free to rise and fall by their own merits in a post-reconstruction world. And if it so happens that it's a little tougher in the beginning, then surely it will work its way out because, and then this is- a Or a little tougher in Mississippi than it is in Massachusetts. That's right. Although, again, it's easy for us looking back to see that. Uh, I mean, so I write about this period and, and what's really striking is the progressive, which is the moment for, as you described, the nation to sort of assume uh, a different posture and a more, um, a, a, a much more, uh, reflection of liberalism that is c contemporary, not one that is passive, not one that assumes that markets will resolve tension. And those progressives were deeply conflicted about what they could do on behalf of black people uh, beyond a kind of genuflection to the principle of equality, mm -hmm. because that really was the issue. The principle of equality, if that could be protected and guaranteed, uh, then the state had no other role to play in terms of enforcing equality. If, um, I'd like to go back to Katrina's point about this being a movement um, moment. I think it is a movement moment, but you're optimistic about this movement moment, and I'm, I'm much more cautious or maybe even pessimistic about it. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. I mean, I don't want to be pessimistic. But um, I was in um, the Army a um, long time ago, and, and I remember when I was writing at the time, at times at the beginning of the Iraq War, I was certainly against the invasion of Iraq. But this country had been attacked, and I was in favor of going after the Tal Taliban. I'm not in, I mean, uh, Al Qaeda. I'm not in any sense a pacifist. But what I have seen unfold was that insane war in, a, in Iraq, and then, you know, whatever you want to call the incursion into Afghanistan. But no effort on the part of this country. To, to win uh, the wars. And now, you know, Obama is uh, sending some troops again into uh, Iraq. So what I keep seeing, or what I don't see, are results. I see a lot of talk. I see a lot of people writing. I've done a great deal of the writing um, myself. Uh, I see a lot of um, uh, intellectualism going on. But I don't see results. And so just a few days ago, we had another nine people, nine worshipers, murdered in a church in Charleston, South Carolina. I don't think there's anyone in this room who doesn't believe that in another uh, few weeks or another couple of months, we'll see another atrocity like that. And I don't see any progress being made uh, on that. And I, I feel the same way about a lot of other issues. So what I'm looking for is more activism from more people and more results. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not a rosy optimist, but 
Uh, <laughs> um, so let me revert to my natural stance. I mean, you have to understand being editor of the nation, one wakes up in the morning and you want to imagine the world as it might be, the alternatives. And then you are grounded both in a pragmatic politics, which you don't want to fall into, that pit, but you have to. But the nation has tried to stand aside. And for example, in our opposition to the Iraq war, this country, not only this country, but liberals were rooting for the war. So we stood in opposition, along, by the way, with something Laura covered and our great correspondent Jonathan Schell, the other global superpower. There were millions of people around the world who opposed that war. So we lost, because this country went to war, and it was a disaster. But there are those people who were in the streets are still fighting for a world free of austerity, a world free from endless war, and they are there to be, and more mobile, they're more mobilized now than they were a decade ago. So I think that you make progress in fits and starts, as Don said, we draw on our history to remind ourselves of disasters we have confronted, but also, let me end by saying Gore Vidal, our correspondent of many years, once described the nation as a journalistic alert system. In 1954, the nation argued for a negotiated solution to Vietnam. 68 editorials later, thousands dead. But one has to keep reminding people that there are alternatives. And I think that those ideas find their place. Someone once said, I think, you know, we're the journalism of a minority. I don't accept that because we will always fight for a different kind of majority and a different kind of America. Do you think you speak for your audience, for your readership, or to them? Which is your priority? That's a good question. I hate to think of speaking to, because we never want to be hectoring. We try to, I think we need to try to speak to where people are, but lead and guide through ideas. I, you know, I look at Michael Denzel Smith, who uh, wrote a cover story last year on the fight, new fight for racial justice. I draw inspiration from that and from James Baldwin's writings, but when we editorialized this week in opposition to broken windows policing, we're speaking to a number of audiences. We were speaking to those who have been victims. We're speaking to those who care about a different kind of criminal justice. And we're speaking to an administration, a mayor who the nation endorsed, because it has endorsing power, and the mayor says he wouldn't be there if mm -hmm. it wasn't for the nation. So you use that power to try, through inside, outside mechanisms, a belief that movements fundamentally make transformative change, but you have allies inside. And I believe that's part of the nation walking on two or three legs, as Don writes in the book, that we're both independent, ferociously so, dissident, but we also try and speak to different audiences and won't give up doing that. I'm, I'm curious what your experience was at, at the times, um, Bob, and whether you think this field of journalism has changed from one, I mean, the nation has had everybody from Pat Buchanan to Pat Williams writing. One piece. One piece. <laughs> one piece. On prison conditions in St. Louis. It was Wasn't when he a was bad very piece. young, a, a young muckraking Pat Buchanan, who knew? Um, but we have come into a journalistic era where there are self-selected audiences for sort of sectarian views. And audiences almost never cross, uh, except perhaps to hurl epithets, um, from the camp that they've decided is theirs to one that might challenge their views. And in the light of that, I wonder what it demands of journalism and what it demands of what, what your experience was, because I'm sure you had a similar, you have a lot of fan mail and then you had hate mail. And did anybody listen to the other side? Yeah, I think um, some time ago people had more of a tendency to listen to the other side uh, than they do now. But I think um, uh, journalism or media writ large now has really fallen down on the job. I think it's, it's done a terrible job. I, I, w one of the problems that I see is that um, everybody's a commentator now. I mean, there was a time, w w I always thought even being a columnist, that columnist got much too much attention, which is why everybody wanted to be uh, a <laughs> columnist. 
But the most important people at, at newspapers and news magazines and, and in news divisions on television were reporters, the folks who actually go out there and bring you the news and actually really understand understand the stories. And what's happened in this new sort of media age of ours is that everyone is an instant pundit. And for a variety of reasons, in some cases because organizations don't have enough money to pay for you know, reporters or for bureaus or uh, overseas bureaus and that sort of thing, that's, that's one reason we get less reporting. But another is that um, uh, standards have fallen. So in the old days, you had to uh, build up a track record um, um, people had to see that you had some uh, well of expertise on issues and that you were qualified to be a commentator before you actually got the job of being a columnist or an editorial writer or something along those lines. And I think that that's not, that's not the case now. So that's what's going on with the press. And then very quickly, I think that I also have a problem with the audience, uh, the television viewers and the readers of journalism because it's not enough just to read stuff, to understand it, to have your strong feelings about uh, this or, or that. You really have to respond mm. to it. If this stuff is as important as I think, and, and I guess we all think that um, it is, then you have to read about it, learn about it, and then go out and do something mm. about it. And I think there's just not enough people doing something uh, about Lily, it. you want to come yeah. in on that? Yeah, I just want to pick up on this point because I, I agree with Bob. Um, wholeheartedly uh, on the critique of, of engagement. But I think part of it is that there, there is a, a cultural response to the commentary that people actually think by responding to the commentary, they're actually doing something. Mm -hmm. uh, you in, mean in, in a comment line? That's right. <laughs> uh, or on their own blog. Mm -hmm. uh, in a, in a way that, and I'm not belittling it, because it, it is a form of the demos, and people have voice, uh, and they can build their own communities around that. But in a way that you might uh, recall that the commentary might inspire a study group that might organize for a series of strategic protests mm -hmm. uh, where people speak in the public sphere. Uh, and, and today, people are essentially speaking through hashtags and Facebook posts. And it sort of takes, it takes literally the wind out of one's sail. Like, so what you might say in the public sphere that might inspire others standing on the sideline feels that the, it's being contained in these spaces. And I'm not, I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but it is fundamentally different. And therefore, that kind of in the street resistance feels like it's moving um, in different directions. But if I could, but we're gonna hear from Michelle Chen uh, who writes for the nation, but I think you do have the hashtags and you have Facebook, but you also have now in the streets and some of the mobilization online is leading people, fast food workers, for example, demanding higher minimum wage. The climate march, again, organized offline, online into the streets. So you, you, need, you need both of those. And I do think that journalism I agree with Bob, but I also think there are new, what I call transpartisan coalitions, mm. ideas coalitions, other coalitions being formed, for example, around surveillance or criminal justice, which may be suspect in your eyes, but I think that there's a possibility of breaking open some of these filter bubbles around certain issues. The nation you know, began in that way. We were, as Don, I always, grown when Don reminds us of the ties to the Republican Party, but I will also say that the nation joined with Mark Twain in the Anti-Imperialist League, and that was a very transpartisan coalition of, you know, folks. So mm -hmm. I, I think that the balance between pessimism regarding engagement and the optimism is one to think hard about. Um, there are people moving around with uh, index cards which they want you to write on. Or if you have an index card, they're collecting your index cards and we're gonna get to questions from the audience in just a bit. Um, I wanna bring up our three uh, journalists in the field right now in a second. But before we do, on that qu very question, um, uh, Khalil, of changing opinions, I do want you to share just a little bit, and maybe you'll be sharing it in the pages of the nation, I don't know, of your experience recently to Germany, looking at the comparative incarceration practices in that country. Because I'm curious, 
what you do with that information, where you see change happening on that topic, uh, and how it's happening, and is a journal like The Nation helping? Sure. So uh, a U.S. delegation, including four prison commissioners, New Mexico, Washington, Tennessee, and uh, Connecticut, along with governor of Connecticut, Malloy, a couple of prosecutors, and a couple of academics and journalists, went for a week to study prisons in Germany in Berlin and Northwest Germany. Uh, they have a ninth of the incarceration rate of the United States. They had a violent crime spike around the same time period as the United States did in the 1970s and early 80s. Their incarceration rate stayed low and flat, um, by contrast to ours, went, which went through the roof. Uh, why is that? It's because since 1949, when the United States helped to establish a new constitution for Germany, and since 1976, with a set of constitutional mandates, they privileged three things in punishment. Human dignity, do no harm, and socialize the uh, people incarcerated to life on the outside, including having metal utensils such as knives, forks, and spoons in their rooms. So this delegation uh, was there to see for themselves um, at every level of criminal justice uh, administration with the hope that each will become an evangelist for using their imaginations to think and do differently in this country. And from a governor to people responsible for punishment to people who prosecute those who have broken the law uh, to academics and journalists might, might out of that cacophony of voices and perspectives and responsibilities uh, might uh, help to fundamentally change our system. So, uh, as I said then, and I'll say it tonight for the first time publicly, my job is to use my voice uh, and my pen to make uh, this experience tangible and meaningful uh, for as many people as possible, because in some ways we do not have to reinvent the wheel, mm -hmm. or I in many I, ways. I think I hear a forthcoming article for The Nation yes. magazine. <laughs> let's bring up some of our, our, our contributors who are in the front row, and let, let's start with you, um, uh, Michelle Chen. You have been covering the fight for 15, the low-wage workers struggle. Uh, talk a little bit, if you will, about how you see your work in a historic kind of scope. Are there, are there parallels? Are you conscious of parallels uh, to the fights for the eight-hour day in the early years of the nation? Michelle, stand up and let the uh, this video somewhere. Is this on? <laughs> yes, uh, very good. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I actually am, um, in my other hat, um, I'm actually uh, studying for a a PhD in history, and I've I've often sort of started to peruse the pages of the Nation archives, um, uh, looking at some of my own research on the intersections between social movements and civil liberties. And I guess it's just sort of amazing to see um, the resonance um, between um, social movements and the printed word, and I guess the public sphere in, a, in another way. But uh, it's interesting to hear people reflect on, you know, what is the relative power of a hashtag versus, uh, you know, a study group or a petition or something like that. I think I sort of came of age as a writer, and maybe the very tail end of uh, when we had, you know, paper publications, and I did a zine, and I think I sort of remember, um, uh, you know really valuing um, the ability for people to, you know, non-professional writers yeah. to sort of be able to put their thoughts out there and, and find their own community. Right, I want you to um, put your face out there. So let, oh. me, let me bring you right over here and have you look at our lovely audience here. Oh, God, okay. <laughs> I was hoping you wouldn't make me do when this. You, when you say, when you're, when you're there working with the, the, the warm-up campaigners or the activists who've been fighting for 15, and you say you're here with the nation, what happens? Um, well, I, I hope they kind of know what, what you don't the nation see a, Do you is. see a dull look on their face? Do you see any spark of recognition? I, I do. I think, I think I do. I mean, I, 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 try, I, I hope so. Yes. I, yes. I forgot who invited me here. So, um, yes, I see. I mean, well, the thing is, like, I, I get such a weird range of responses because there are some people who dare say, are closer to my age, who may not have the, the spark of recognition. But um, I mean, I, I interview so many people who are like, you know, I've been reading The Nation since God knows how long. And, and, and to see how formative it was in their political thinking and how it brought them to where they are now. And so I, I just, I, I mean, it, it's a source of endless fascination to me as both a historian and as, you know, a writer today, just to see, um, 
you know, we, we often just see snapshots of movements in the way that we're experiencing them at the moment. But I think, um, if anything, uh, the value of having um, those experiences, those collective experiences documented in a place like The Nation is that it allows us to sort of anchor our thoughts and um, to anchor sort of our life experiences and sort of a broader spectrum mm. of human experience. Do you so. have a question for any of these guys? Um, <laughs> yeah, I actually had a question um, for Don. I, I guess I'm, I'm looking at... Hi, Michelle. Um, <laughs> Hi. Nice to meet you. Um, yes, uh, but uh, thank you for all the wonderful archival work that you've done. <laughs> and um, I, I guess I just thought, I mean, our, um, what goes through your head when you think about um, sort of, uh, I, I'm doing a lot of research on the McCarthy era right now and um, looking at the nation and sort of some of the stances that it took at that time and sort of the, the sense of risk that um, people who, uh, but, you know, as media makers, what they made then. And I, I guess I was just wondering, like, what stands out to you at that point? Where did it fall in the spectrum of, of media more broadly at the time? Because it seems like, again and again, it's always just this one publication that is a touchstone. Sure. No, I mean, the, you know, if you look at, I mean, we, Katrina hates when I talk about the 1890s because it was our not finest hour. Um, so I would say that the... The McCarthy era was definitely one of the nation's finest hours. Um, and what goes through my mind are two things. One is that we were lucky um, because we survived. Uh, the state brought to bear enormous power on public opinion during the 1950s. And the nation resolutely refused to jump onto the anti-communist bandwagon. Um, it was red baited mercilessly not just by McCarthy and Hoover and, you know, there is a very thick nation FBI file, um, but also by, uh, by liberals like Arthur Schlesinger, who called, you know, the nation the typhoid Mary of the left or something like that. Um, and so it was really one of those times when uh, character was totally revealed and the nation was very lucky in its editor, Carrie McWilliams, who was a Californian. And I think perhaps as a Californian, m able to take a stance somewhat more independent of the East Coast consensus, but also it was lucky in its financing and its backers. It was a very lean operation then. And although it, not a lot of money came in, nobody wanted to buy ads. If you read The Nation and you lived in parts of the country, you probably would get an FBI file just for getting it delivered to you. Certainly the postmasters in lots of states reported to the FBI people were getting The Nation and that was considered evidence of suspicious behavior. So it was a very um, difficult time and I think the magazine on the one hand was lucky to come through it and on the other hand came through it in part because it deserved to. Now, Katrina, in the 1940s, I think it was, the nation ran a piece by a whistleblower about Washington's Gestapo, about the FBI uh, <laughs> spying on, on its workers and the, and the, uh, the sort of the, be the very beginnings of, of red baiting. I'm so Would thrilled you, do you it mentioned today? that. <laughs> Would you do it today? <laughs> Would you do it today? That's a question for you, Bob. <laughs> An XXX whistleblower anonymous contribution attacking the FBI of Gestapo I think, tactics? I think we've seen <clears throat> I think we've seen the power of whistleblowers in these last few years, and yes. Uh, but, you, but the nation never revealed who, who authored that, right? You know, the nation, this is about resistance. One thing that strikes me, Don, talking about the McCarthy period, the, the nation has resisted succumbing to fear, whether it's the fear that pervaded the land during the McCarthy period or whether it's the fear that pervaded um, this country after 9-11 and didn't seek revenge, but sought a just response. Uh, the nation nearly, you know, the nation was published in Alabama for a year because the printing houses here would not publish it, and Kerry McWilliams had a friend who published a farmer's almanac. Um, a librarian in Bartlesville, Oklahoma, was fired because she accepted nation subscription. I mean, we forget that period, but one of the arc of historical engagements in the special issue is, you know, from red baiting McCarthyism to Islamophobia. Um, you see that fear in the nation's resistance, mm -hmm. and I think that um, is, is vital. And I do think the McCarthy era was one of the nations um, when, it stood, when it stood tall. 
Let me bring um, Sarah Leonard in. Come up, come up to this odd little position that we're doing where you're kind of talking to them and kind of talking to us. And, and let me ask you the simple question in the position that you are now as managing editor, is that the fancy title? Uh, I'm a senior editor. Senior editor. What is the inducement you offer young writers or new writers to write for the nation? As I understand it, from my own experience. Enormous um, wealth. I was going to say, the, the pay is not great. Calvin Trillin referred to it, what is the, the high two figures. Um, <laughs> why do people do it? Um, well, I would say to start, first of all, we do try to um, pay particularly young writers as much as we can, whereas a lot of, say, academics are willing to write for a bit less. And because it's a political project, this is sort of an act of solidarity. Um, but, you know, uh, I think there's, there's, for starters, a lot of young reporters, there's um, curiosity. And so, uh, speaking from recent personal experience, um, I wanted to see a left party win an election. Being an American, I thought, what would that look like? How odd. Uh, so I went to Greece um, and had the pleasure of seeing Syriza elected and thought I would write a short post about it. But as a result, what really happened was, was being a reporter gives you an excuse to ask a lot of questions. And so we spent a lot of time drinking a, a huge quantity of Rocky with a lot of Syriza operatives. Um, and because we were press, we were, we were able to, to uh, justify our curiosity with the fact that a story would come out of it and Americans would better understand the Greek situation. Um, and that is what happened. And uh, the real pleasure in that was uh, I found there had been a lot written about Greece. Um, and particularly, I relied very heavily on the writing of Maria Margaronis, our real Greece correspondent, who uh, was greeted as a celebrity among the series of people we were hanging out with. It was very charming. They were like, oh, Maria, Maria, Maria is coming. <laughs> so the nation was known, certainly, in Greece. And we got a good response from saying that's who we were with. Um, but it gave us an excuse to um, uh, sort of figure out what the commonalities might be between the work being done in Greece and the work being done here. So I had been doing a lot of editing around Black Lives Matter. Um, and so I was, and they were asking, a lot of the activists were asking a lot of questions about new organizational strategies, taking a lot of new inspiration from the Panthers in particular, which was really interesting. And so, we talked to a bunch of solidarity organizers in Greece who were taking similar inspiration, including from the American past, also activism in Latin America. But they're like, oh, yeah, the Panthers breakfast program, really important. We're like, great. So we're like, putting that in an article and publishing it in the US served, um, hopefully, a, a useful function of saying, here are some things we noticed in common. Maybe you guys can talk, right? And so that, that's a small step, but it, it feels a little bit useful. Um, and further, it sort of expands. Um, folks were talking about uh, the moral imagination um, and expanding the sense of possibility in relatively closed times. And we felt that uh, looking at a left party being elected in a validly anti-capitalist party uh, might help to expand the range of possibilities in people's minds here and that that might be useful. Certainly, if a bunch of prison administrators can look at uh, international comparisons for a broader sense of what might be, I think we can uh, do at least as well. Let me bring up Michael. Thank you. Laura, before you, you, yeah. <laughs> before you get too far along, I want to warn the audience that I have already sent out a tweet, and there will be a, a protest and demonstration yeah. uh, following tonight's program, <laughs> inspired by all of the smart things that are being said right now. So We're, That's what folks, we like to see. Lace up your shoes. <laughs> Michael, you write for lots of different outlets. I'd love you to talk a bit about what's different about the nation. What do you think you can say there, or what do you use your space in the nation to say different? Uh, I use my space in the nation to say, fuck the police. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, but yeah, that's basically it. Uh, no, I, I, and it was always uh, a goal of mine to write for the nation um, starting my career because um, it is a magazine of 
resistance and, uh, and, and ideas that don't fit or, or are too ahead of their time to fit into the, the, the current body politic. Um, and for me, um, I need that space not just to challenge um, others, but to challenge myself uh, to think through what, what is the world that I want to see. Um, and the nation allows me that space. I don't know anywhere else uh, that I reasonably, with the type of audience or the size of audience that the nation has, that I could, could have written about abolishing the police and it be published. Um, and, and that sort of value in this space where we're, we're talking about um, Black Lives Matter, uh, it, which is interesting to me when we, when those three women, Opal, Alicia, and Patrice, I've interviewed all of them. Uh, they, do a lot of, they do a lot of interviews now. No one talks to them about the fact that they're abolitionists. Like they're prison and police abolitionists. But we talked about that in our interviews. And that's what the value of the nation is, is that, you know, as the narrative of, of movements um, becomes mainstream, uh, I mean, we can look at this, the ways in which the, you're using past movements as, as a way to sort of uh, chastise current mm. activists for their, their tactics, right? Like, the, there's a mainstream narrative of what resistance looks like. Uh, there's an official doctrine that you're supposed to follow, um, but the nation, offers the space to, to challenge that, to, to say um, this is what it actually looks like on the ground. This is what the actual ideas of these people are. This is the world that they envision. Uh, and it doesn't look anything like that because, because you, know, you can write your, your, your you know, activists can get interviewed and be put in like, Oprah Magazine and New York Times, uh, Mag all of these places, and the message gets watered down. It's like, it's stop killing us. It's like, yeah, stop killing us, but what else? What is the thing that we're actually looking for that, that equates justice? And that's what, you know, writing for the nation, I've had to challenge myself in that. Um, and push new ideas forward. Uh, and I, I don't know another space that I would be afforded that opportunity. I'm honestly surprised that they keep me around. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're not the first. Let me, let me ask, thanks very much, Michael, appreciate it. And I, I'd love to hear everybody's questions for the panelists here, but I mean, he's not the first to say fuck the police in the pages of the nation with some different language. James Baldwin I mean, said very clearly, the police are to keep Negroes in place and serve white business interests. That's their job. Michael reminded us of that in his piece, Calling for Abolition. Um, has this conversation moved in all of these years? Have we, have we got a more robust conversation about alternatives to current police strategy today than we did I think there certainly years is ago? a more robust conversation going on, and I agree wholeheartedly with Katrina that Black Lives Matter matters has been, um, Black Lives Matter has been an incredibly important, um, and it's growing into a movement, so it's an incredibly important movement. And people are not only uh, talking about that issue, um, they're actually, in some cases, doing something about policing in this country. I think that's a perfect example of the importance of activism as opposed to just sort of chatter. The Black Lives Matter people were out there on the front lines of this very important issue, and they sustained, they sustained mm -hmm. that effort. The same thing seems to be going on, I hope it continues, uh, with the low-wage low worker um, movement. I want to see much, much more of that now, you know, um, this young fellow uh, talks about, I guess, I'm abolishing the piece. I have to apologize. I didn't see Michael. the piece. Um, I am very much in favor of radical voices. I think there are not nearly enough radical voices in this country on a range of issues. 
but that's a little more radical <laughs> than I'm quite ready to get to myself at the moment. If I, I mean, I, I, want, I, want to hear, I want to hear Khalil, but one of the strengths of the nation, and Don writes about this, and it's in the special issue, is one of the reasons we've survived 150 years is that the nation has been a forum for a debate between radicals and liberals, conservatives with a conscience, anarchists, libertarians, progressives, and I think that is a strength because in that debate comes energy, comes different ideas. Um, and Michael spoke beautifully about the space the nation gives his ideas, and we, we must, but there, you know, there's also, you heard it here, Bob Herbert saying, okay, <laughs> we need more radical mm -hmm. voices, but they're also, and, and there was that same tension with Daryl Pinckney when we had at the Schomburg, at the Schomburg we, when, when we launched uh, we the did a nation event around its race writing. Uh, just to Michael's credit, um, and this is maybe to think about, to remind us that Black Lives Matter starts as a hashtag, right? It, it starts with media playing a role. But uh, we brought together many of the people at Michael's coordination and moderation who are now on the front lines of the millennial activism, and Ashley Yates from Ferguson, and Philip Agnew, who's represented uh, with the Dream Defenders. So I want to just affirm both Michael's role in pushing the envelope. Uh, I had never heard police abolition until he said it at the Schomburg Center, which either makes me feel like I'm not quite as engaged as I ought to be, or that it really was a formulation uh, that had not yet been articulated um, as prominently uh, as it should be. We, we talk a lot about prison abolition, but very few people have, have put those two concepts together. Finally, I just want to answer um, Laura's question about Baldwin and, and Michael. Uh, one of the things that I think is so striking about the nation, and what I think distinguishes it from um, other magazines, um, particularly that have a more, a larger online presence as opposed to what's printed, which of course is just now a percentage of the content. And that is a commitment to deep historicization. Yeah. It, it, it feels as though no editor is gonna let a piece walk out um, of the proverbial door at the nation without some attention to historical context. Uh, and so in a way that I contribute, uh, both as a writer and as an interviewee uh, on, a, you know, for a number of publications, I can tell on the other end what the commitment to, particularly to the journalist, journalist who's asking the question, is to one, fact checking, <laughs> which is a lost art these days, uh, and, and two, to questioning the assumptions. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it seems to me that with a magazine that has 150 years and with an archive where you can e e easily, as the writer, check your own assumptions, but also check the people who are giving you information, check their context and sense of the world and to put it in a particular context and not take it as gospel because you agree with it, mm -hmm. that to me is a measure of uh, the work that the nation does and the platform that uh, makes, something, makes someone like Michael or Sarah or Michelle so important at this moment. One of the things I appreciate about The Nation, and I appreciate about having been invited to do sometimes for The Nation, is to write about movements over time. And to see somebody like uh, Alicia Garza, one of the, the, the co-founders of Black Lives Matter, emerge from the domestic workers' union, uh, it reminds you that these movements don't just pop out in response or in reaction to a, a national sort of attention-getting moment, but rather are the product of years of organizing and years of developing of, of new talent, which is something that I think the nation also does quite well and has done historically. Reading your book, you, you see the kind of job the nation has done of talent spotting, uh, both in the sort of fictional, in, in the um, non-fiction um, journalism, but also in the creative work uh, and cultural criticism. And we haven't talked much about cultural criticism, but I think I read in your book that the nation hired what was probably the first female art critic, um, which is exciting. In the, in the 1870s. In the 1870s. Uh, published poetry, um, published increasingly um, cartoons and um, caricatures under um, Victor's tenure, but I wonder, you know, there's some questions here about reaching new audiences on the digital front. I want to pose those to you, but I also want to know, you know, what's your vision for the look of the magazine and its treatment of um, 
visual arts in particular and uh, pop culture in this time, Katrina? Resistance, no. <laughs> <laughs> Resistance, insistence, and abolition. Um, you know, look at, the, I mean, again, please take a look at the special issue. I was struck going down to the new Whitney to see several artists in the exhibit, Louis Lozewick, William Gropper, Sue Coe, Hugo Gellert. These are artists who have filled the pages of the nation. Um, Sarah Leonard is someone, we work closely on the quote front of the magazine to build in art and images. We are going big digital on July 6th in tribute to our actual birthday. We're launching a new site which has the ability to do photo journalism quality investigative journalism with photos, with testimony, with art, and we're very proud of it. Um, I do think uh, there is a crisis of journalism in this country, as Bob was talking about. Most of all, I think it's really a crisis of the business model. I do think there's great quality journalism being done. You can hear from some of the journalists tonight. We have people working with us who are extraordinarily talented and committed to ideas, to the historicism Khalil spoke about. And, but we want to reach a new generation. Mm -hmm. um, we now reach 500,000 people a week on all these, quote, different platforms. Would I prefer to be in meetings talking about socialism versus democracy as opposed to paywall versus no paywall? <laughs> yes, but there are strategic decisions to be made because I do believe in another thing. I think, and I'm struck, if I could digress for one minute, I'm struck by Bernie Sanders' campaign. There's t several questions here about that, so I'm glad you got to it. I'm struck because as he travels the country, I've been reading less about his platform, which the nation has been covering for years, his ideas, but more about people in towns who say they'd never really heard of Bernie Sanders. They'd never heard of his ideas, but they like his ideas. They seem in accord with sort of mainstream, best sense of that word, sensibilities they have. And I think if I could be humble enough to draw a parallel with the nation, Kerry McWilliams, our great former editor, used to say the nation is, a, is a, once people find it, it becomes a lifeline. Mm. But it's finding the nation. So I want to make sure that our ideas, our journalism, our writers are out there in the broader culture. Because I think if people hear what we are writing about, our ideas, they will join, build it, they will come. <laughs> I like, this, I like the reporting on the Bernie Sanders campaign that points out that uh, he's getting more people than Hillary Clinton and she serves snacks. <laughs> Bob, one of the questions here is about citizen journalists. What role will citizen journalists play moving forward and how will they impact journalism in the long term? Well, I think citizen journalists are um, important, in, but the thing about citizen journalists is um, uh, the way I view them, I view that as uh, reporting. I, you know, I don't, I view that, I don't view that as um, um, commenting or commentators and that sort of thing. Uh, one of the things um, that's, that's going on now, though, is before you get to citizen journalism is when you get to um, mainstream media. So there's great, there's great reporting consistently um, at the nation. I mean, I, I, I just have believed that for years and years, not because I'm up here on this, this panel. It, you know, it's a hell of a magazine. But look at uh, CNN, for example, and look at the audience that CNN has. I think it's a disaster. I think it's a, it's a catastrophe. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it often looks like a Saturday Night Live skit. Um, I think... I think that, you know, networks like ABC, CBS, and NBC, and I used to be a correspondent for NBC, now you very seldom get any, any news there. Uh, you know, there's like uh, maybe 22 minutes on the, on the nightly news. It's all canned, and that's why Americans have not heard about Bernie Sanders. Right. I've been covering Bernie Sanders um, for years. So if, if um, citizen journalists can begin to get the word out on some of these things, it would be very helpful if that was a way for other um, broader outlets to pick up on stuff. That, that tends not to happen. I'm against it because I think it leaves so much space left for people like you and me to do our own shows. <laughs> if you haven't seen um, Bob's op-ed TV, op-ed.tv at CUNY television, uh, check it out. Grit TV interviews all the folks that the other people leave out from uh, people with grit, forward thinkers from around the world <laughs> uh, on uh, Channel 34 and Telesaur and Link TV. Um, I'm confident that we will need, be needed to continue to do this work because the networks are never going to do it, even if they had the inclination. Can I just say one more thing about Bernie Sanders? Yeah. Um, 
I said on um, one of the talking head uh, moments a, a few weeks ago where Bernie's campaign was, yeah, <laughs> funding, uh, where uh, uh, one of the uh, panelists was bad-mouthing Bernie and this is a joke and blah, 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 blah. And I said at the time that Bernie Sanders is going to get a lot more attention and a lot more votes in, in some of these key primaries um, than people expect. Yeah. And he is going to cause Hillary Clinton problems, and he is going to move the debate in this country to the left. And that's already happening, and it's been happening faster than I anticipated. Let's get to some of the other questions here. I could keep talking about Bernie Sanders. Uh, there's a... Oh. Oh, okay, there's one there, but I've got a whole handful here. There's a growing anti-capitalist movement worldwide. How can it move beyond defining itself by negation and create political power and affect the, and, and affect the fundamental change that's needed in this world? Um, so how does an anti-capitalist uh, movement redefine itself? I'm uh, going to take two, one minute. First of all, take the attacks on those who oppose the corporate-backed trade agenda. They are defined as anti-trade, anti-globalization by a media which is for the most part for this corporate back trade agenda for a lot of reasons they are not we are not against fair trade we are not against globalization the question is globalization by whom for whom with whom on whom and there are alternatives there are alternative plans which are real that would change the economic paradigm we live with which would rewrite the rules and you cover this we try to cover this those are rarely covered. Therefore, it allows those who want to tarnish and stigmatize and marginalize the possibility to do so. I'll say quickly that I think, um, so one of the things that we heard a little bit of this earlier is I've often bemoaned the absence of utopian literature in this moment. Uh, and there's some of it, but it's not nearly as prominent or sort of newly canonical in the way that a uh, hundred years ago, I mean, people were really um, thinking about what's possible in terms of e an anti-capitalist agenda. Uh, a little known um, point in Dr. King's journey was that Coretta and uh, him shared Edward Bellamy's Looking Backwards while they were dating in 1952, uh, where in a love letter he wrote to her and, and talked about uh, the circumstances of capitalism as he understood them in, in, in that moment. And I think there's a lesson there uh, that our cultural workers have a real part to play in helping to answer that question. Uh, we really need a lot more people invested um, in, in imagining possibilities that are not bound by the practicalities of politics or money or yes. fill in the blank. The Edward Bellamy book um, was a sort of 1880s utopian novel at the height of kind of industrial capitalism's growth in the United States, considering other directions uh, for the future of the economy. Um, at Grit TV, we've recently dubbed, renamed capitalism uh, on the basis of how selfish and antisocial it is, anti-socialism. Um, and I'm going to try to stick to that. Where you have an ally in the Pope. Yes, there you go. I have an ally in the Pope. Just what I always wanted, a Pope on my side. That's a whole nother question. Um, in terms of resistance, how can the nation do better to demand more structural economic change in an era with a center-right neoliberal democratic president and a candidate that appears to be much further to his right? I mean, how, it's a sort of a question of how do you negotiate an election year? And I also would love to add, how do you negotiate respectability? Because the, the arc of your book, Don, is from non you know, lack of respectability to respectability as a positive, and I'm, not sure. Oh, I disagree. I think the arc of my book is from uh, insurrection to respectability and back again. All right. <laughs> and um, in some ways, that question is kind of like the previous question. Mm -hmm. And I would argue that the nation has always, and certainly under Katrina, continues to look for, demand, and expect utopian thinking to be part of our conversation. Uh, that utopian thinking is one of the I suppose derives much of its energy from art and poetry, and so I think art and poetry should always have a place in the magazine. They certainly, in the special issue that we worked on together, art, art and poetry are quite prominent. Um, and I, I think we both felt that was very important. Um, as for 
economic restructuring, you know, there's an article by Joel Rogers that I'm really proud of that's in the special issue that calls for an entire new economic dispensation. I think the idea is to continue the conversation and also, as Khalil po kindly pointed out, be aware of our past, be aware of where some of our past enthusiasms may have led us astray. It, just, uh, we're now gonna really hit Bernie Sandy, Sanders territory. <laughs> what, um, just one thing about Bernie Sanders, we have an interview with him in our next issue. Um, you know, he talks about Scandinavia and often Denmark as models. Denmark's just moved center right. Um, but he, to retrieve radical possibilities from our own history is also something that he talks about. Yeah. Um, and so I think that becomes um, very important. But the utopian and the radical, some of it, I have to say, a renewal, a revival of interest in science fiction globally. And Ray Bradbury in our special issues speaks to this utopian quality. So it's a mix of fic fiction, reality. Um, uh, we, I had the great pleasure of, of interviewing the co-authors of a new book of um, visionary science fiction from activists, Adrian Marie Brown and Imarisha Walida, talking about their new book, Octavia's Brood, in uh, the pages of The Nation just a few mm -hmm. issues ago, which is uh, definitely worth a read, talking about imagining the future. We need to wrap, but there's a lot of questions here about both the sort of reaching of new audiences, engaging of new audiences, um, using language that can get outside of the bubble. Um, at very fundamentally, also these questions of uh, e escaping from the polarization of the discourse. This is almost every question asks about this. I would love a, a, com a closing comment from each of you on an op a chance, a, a, a journalistic ex experience that you've had either at The Nation or elsewhere that you felt really did manage to make a shift, did manage to change either the discourse or an issue um, or make a real difference in people's lives. Uh, you know, I can think of a few, but I, I'd love to hear what you have to say along these issues of what, what real change has journalism done in your life, has made in your life? I'm not sure I can answer that question. But I want to, I was thinking about when you said um, new audiences letting people in, and I was thinking about what Michael said. Mm -hmm. So for me, part of it is uh, signaling that people don't need to, shouldn't feel excluded from the conversation. Mm -hmm. And I, I think the nation needs to welcome younger readers. It needs to make it clear that people can join in. Now, my way of interpreting that is through s civil argument that I, I like it that the nation has always been a place where arguments have been civil. On the other hand, I think it's also really important to make room for people whose argument is, fuck the police. And I think we need to do, and it's hard to do both. That's a tough balancing act. Um, I can tell you about an, a journalistic incident in my life that brought home to me why I wasn't happy with the mainstream media, which is uh, in 1983, I was working for Newsweek as a writer on the foreign desk, and I had to cover the Chesterfield by-election in Britain when Tony Benn was uh, returned to Parliament after a period out. Tony Benn was, of course, a great radical champion, socialist, wonderful, the best prime minister Britain ever had. Um, and I had gone to graduate school in England, so I knew who he was. At Newsweek, that was a problem because the article that I was supposed to write was how this terrible communist red had, you know, alarmist person had managed to sneak back into parliament and was gonna cause all sorts of trouble. And um, that was what our, the sort of collective corporate product that I was given to translate into readable prose, because that was your job as a writer on the foreign desk. That's what I was handed. And I rewrote it to reflect what I knew to be the case. And the impact that had on me is I got fired. <laughs> so, uh, and I like to think of the nation as a place where people are never asked to re revise their reporting in conflict with reality. So I have a, a quick anecdote. I was on an MSNBC program for the first time about three years ago and coming out of academia as a historian, uh, but I, I was communicating in a way that was perfectly normal to me 
but the host following the show said, do you think the audience will understand colonialism? <laughs> and, and she didn't mean it in, in a way that it was out of bounds, but she worried, she fretted over whether a national audience would appreciate the term. Uh, to her credit, uh, she's pushed the envelope in terms of lifting up um, people's uh, uh, literacy around language. Uh, the, the other example, and this is a positive one, um, Lewis Laffam wrote a piece uh, a few years ago uh, that I, I use as a framework for a lot of public speaking. And to me, for, for what I try to do at the Schomburg Center, and translating uh, both history into uh, the present where appropriate. Um, having a journalist's voice and prose and metaphor as a way of connecting with the public um, is the best, I think, of journalism in the service of, of the kind of do work that, that Bob talked about. Um, and so uh, that piece was so powerful. It was a September uh, 2011 issue with the cover story um, ignorance of things past um, and was a sort of call to recognize and I think coming back to the point of Melissa's show, MHP, um, is that uh, the bar is really low in some ways uh, for what people um, know or their willingness to follow you into strange lands. Uh, so there's a, a lot of opportunity for journalists to, to just write well and clearly and inform. Um, in my own experience, going, just going back to the issue of reporting versus uh, commenting on issues, even as a columnist, I tried um, very often to do reporting. And I, you know, I, and I remember back several years ago, there was a situation in Tulia, Texas, where dozens of African Americans were um, arrested by this rogue uh, cop down there and um, um, bogus drug charges were not only um, placed against them, but they were convicted and sentenced to hideously long terms, up to 300 years in one case, um, many cases of 90 years, 60 some years, and, and that sort of thing. And I did a dozen columns on that. I went down to Tulia, Texas, and just was relentless on that issue. And one of my key sources there uh, was Vanita Gupta, who was a, um, a, a lawyer uh, at the time for representing the defendants, and she is now the leader of the Civil Rights Division in the Justice Department in the, in the Obama administration. <laughs> yeah, she's accusing me of optimism. And then, uh, and, and so, so, um, so I, I do think that uh, journalism can, can uh, really make a difference, but it is much more important, I think, that it be on the reporting side. And in terms of the idea of reaching people, which you mentioned a, a moment ago, I think the best way to, to reach people and to have a truly powerful impact is to look for stories. We know what these big issues are. They're staring us in the face. But look for the real human stories that show how people are affected by these um, big issues. And, that, and I think that's the way to broaden your audience. Yeah. Unusual, um, let me try and tie this together, but um, part of the nation's role has been to change the narrative, change the way people think about something they know they th what to think about. So I've been going to Russia for more than 35 years. In 1985, my husband and I arrived in Gorbachev's Russia, and I covered that evolving story of perestroika and glasnost we lived there for three or four months a year. And the narrative we forget, because if you remember, it was years ago, but Gorbachev became very popular in this country. But you know, you had people like Alexander Haig, who remembers him calling Gorbachev Gucci in Pucci shoes, or Stalin in Gucci shoes. And I think the ability to report in the nation a very different narrative about what was evolving in Russia and to report on Gorbachev himself, someone I would argue who was almost a heretic in the Kremlin, who was a kind of dissident, who called for abolition of nuclear weapons, who had a very different vision of Europe, of the world. So nearly 
30 years later, my husband and I fly to Moscow to do an interview with Edward Snowden. He's not happy to be in Moscow, but he too is a different kind of dissident. When you think of dissidents, he is a global internet visionary dissident. And I think of that strangeness of being in a city I've come to know so well, sitting a half a mile from the Bolshoi of the Kremlin with Edward Snowden and how that country has changed much for the worse, though the demonization of Russia leading us possibly to a new war is a narrative that the nation is trying to fight. But what is dissidence today? And in those examples, in those, inter those 30 years, I think I've found two dissidents, but there are many others, and the meaning of dissidence I think is still up for renewal and revival. And in answering that, I hope we will engage new audiences because I think people value dissidents value troublemakers, value rebels. The new website launches July 6th, is that right? Yeah, and I mean, I don't want to be a huckster, but I will be. <laughs> oh, come, um, on, come, come on, come on. You know, the, the, <laughs> the uh, largest demographic on our website now, and that's before the launch, is 25 to 35 year old readers. And I think, you know, we are gonna reach new audiences and I won't say we're gonna reach them because of a new website. I would argue we'll reach them because we have a platform for the journalism we do. And you've heard a lot about it tonight and it is truly um, humbling and extraordinary to be here and have heard what the nation has meant to so many on stage and writers and editors and others. I wanna thank all of you and all of you and all of you for participating. Here's to, here's to another 150 years.